The Bradford City Stadium fire occurred during a Football League third division match on Saturday 11th May 1985 at the Valley Parade Stadium in Bradford, West Yorkshire, England. It killed 56 spectators and injured at least 265. The stadium was already known for its antiquated design and facilities which included the wooden roof of the main stand. Previous warnings had also been given about the major buildup of litter in the space below the seats in the stand. The stand had been officially condemned and was due to be replaced with a steel structure after the season ended. The match between Bradford City and Lincoln City, the final game of that season, had started in a celebratory atmosphere with the home team receiving the third division championship trophy. At 3.40 pm, Television commentator John Helm remarked upon a small fire in the main stand. In less than four minutes, with the windy conditions, the fire had engulfed the whole stand, trapping some people in their seats. In the panic that followed, fleeing crowds escaped onto the pitch, but others at the back of the stand tried to break down locked exit doors to escape. Many were burned to death at the turnstiles gates, which had also been locked after the match had begun. The disaster led to rigid new safety standards in UK stadiums, including the banning of new wooden grandstands. It was also a catalyst for a substantial redevelopment and modernization of many British football grounds within the following 30 years. Stadium Background Valley Parade in Bradford, West Yorkshire was built in 1886 and was initially the home ground of Manningham Rugby Football Club. Since 1903, when the club was formed, Bradford City Association Football Club had played their home games at the ground. When Bradford City won promotion to the highest level of English football, Division 1, in 1908, club officials sanctioned an upgrade program. Football architect Archibald Leach was commissioned to carry out the work. By 1911, his work was completed. Although there had been some changes to the other parts of the ground, the main stands remained unaltered by 1985. Football ground writer Simon Inglis had warned the club of a buildup of litter beneath the stand because of a gap between the seats. Some repair work was carried out, but in July 1984 the club was warned again, this time by a county council engineer because of the club's plans to claim for ground improvements from the football trust. One letter from the council said the problems should be rectified as soon as possible, a second said a carelessly discarded cigarette could give rise to a fire risk. In March 1985, the club's plans to rebuild the stadium became more apparent when they took delivery of steel for a new roof. The work was expected to cost £400,000. The 1984-85 season had been one of Bradford City's most successful seasons, ending with City clinching the championship title courtesy of a 2-0 victory against Bolton Wanderers in the penultimate game of the season. As a result, Bradford-born captain Peter Jackson was presented with the league trophy before the final game of the season with mid-table Lincoln City at Valley Parade on 11th May 1985. As it was the first piece of league silverware that the club had captured since they won the Division 3 North title 56 years earlier, 11,076 supporters were in the ground. It was nearly double the season's average of 6,610 and included 3,000 fans in the ground's main stand. Fire The match kicked off at 3.04 pm and after 40 minutes of the first half, the score remained 0-0 in what was described as a drab affair with neither team threatening to score. At 3.44 pm, 5 minutes before halftime, the first sign of a fire, a glowing light, was noticed three rows from the back of Block G, as reported by television commentator John Helm. Helm later described the start of the fire in an interview to the Express newspaper. A man over from Australia visiting his son got two tickets to the game. He lit the cigarettes and when it was coming to an end, he put it down on the floorboard and tried to put his foot on it to put it out. It slipped through a hole in the floorboard. A minute later he saw a small plume of smoke so he poured his coffee on it and so did his son. It seemed to put it out. 
But a minute or so later, there was suddenly a bigger whoosh of smoke, so they went to get a steward. By the time they got back, the whole thing had taken off. One witness saw paper or debris on fire about 25 centimeters below the floorboards. The stances did not have risers. This had allowed a large accumulation of rubbish and paper waste in the cavity space under the stand, which had not been cleared for many months. Spectators later spoke of initially feeling their feet becoming warmer. One of them ran to the back of the stand for a fire extinguisher but found none. A police officer shouted to a colleague for an extinguisher, but this call was misheard and instead the fire brigade were radioed. The call was timed at 3.43 pm. The fire escalated very rapidly and flames became visible. Police started to evacuate the stand. As the blaze spread, the wooden stand and the roof covered with layers of highly flammable bituminous roofing felt quickly went the blaze. Burning timbers and molten material fell from the roof onto the crowd and seating below and dense black smoke enveloped the passageway behind the stand where many spectators were trying to escape. One eyewitness, Jeffrey Mitchell, told the BBC, It spread like a flash. I've never seen anything like it. The smoke was choking. You could hardly breathe. As spectators began to cascade over the wall separating the stand from the pitch, the linesman on that side of the pitch informed referee Norman Glover, who stopped the game with three minutes remaining before half time. It took less than four minutes for the entire stand to be engulfed in flames. There were no extinguishers in the stand's passageway for fear of vandalism and one spectator ran to the clubhouse to find one but was overcome by smoke and impeded by others trying to escape. Supporters either ran upwards to the back of the stand or downwards to the pitch to escape. The stand had no perimeter fencing to keep fans from accessing the pitch, thus averting an instance of crush asphyxia as in the 1989 Hillsborough disaster. Footage of the accident at this point shows levels of confusion among the spectators, while many were trying to escape or to cross the pitch to the relative safety of the neighboring stands, other spectators were observed cheering or waving to the still rolling pitch side cameras. Most of the exits at the back were locked or shut and there were no stewards present to open them. The turnstiles were also locked without anyone to unlock them, leaving no escape through the normal entrances and exits. Most of the fans who took this escape road were killed or seriously injured. Seven of these bag exits were forced open or found open. Three men smashed down one door and at least one exit was opened by people outside, which again helped prevent further deaths. There was panic as fans stampeded to an exit which was padlocked. Two or three burly men put their weight against it and smashed the gate open, otherwise many would not have been able to get out. At the front of the stand, men threw children over the wall to help them escape. Most of those who escaped onto the pitch were saved. People who had escaped the fire then tried to assist their fellow supporters. Police officers also assisted in the rescue attempts. One man clambered over burning seats to help a fan, as did player John Hawley. Bradford City's coach Terry Yoret, whose family was in the stand, ran onto the pitch to help evacuate people. Those who escaped were taken out of the ground to neighboring homes and a pub, where a television screened World of Sport, which broadcast video recorded of the fire just an hour after it was filmed. The fire brigade arrived at the ground four minutes after they were initially alerted. However, the fire had consumed the stand entirely by that point and they were faced with huge flames and very dense smoke. As many supporters still required rescue from the stand, they were unable to immediately start fighting the source of the fire. The fire destroyed the main stand completely and left only burnt seats, lamps and metal fences remaining. Some of those who died were still sitting upright in their seats, covered by remnants of tarpaulin that had fallen from the roof. Police worked until 4 am the next morning under lighting to remove all the bodies. Within a few hours of the blaze starting, it was established that 56 people had been killed, many as a result of smoke inhalation, although some of them had survived until reaching hospital. Victims and injured Of the 56 people who died in the fire, 54 were Bradford supporters and two supported Lincoln. 
They included three who tried to escape through the toilets, 27 who were found by exit K and turnstile 6 to 9 at the rear center of the stand, and two elderly people who had died in their seats. Some had been crushed as they tried to crawl under turnstiles to escape. One retired mill worker made his way to the pitch but was walking around on fire from head to foot. People smothered him to extinguish the flames but he later died of his injuries in hospital. Of those who died, 11 were under 18 and 23 were age 65 or over and the oldest victim was the club's former chairman Sam Firth, age 86. More than 265 supporters were injured. The fire was described as the worst fire disaster in the history of British football and the worst football related disaster since 66 spectators died at Ibrox in 1971. After fire, Popplewell Inquiry. The inquiry into the disaster, chaired by Sir Oliver Popplewell and known as the Popplewell Inquiry, led to the introduction of new legislation to improve safety at the UK's football grounds. Among the main outcomes of the inquiry were the banning of the new wooden grandstands at all UK sports grounds, the immediate closure of other wooden stands deemed unsafe and the banning of smoking in other wooden stands. The Popplewell inquiry found that the club had been warned about the fire risk that the rubbish accumulating under the stand had posed. The stand had already been condemned and the demolition teams were due to start work two days later. However, as there was no real precedent, most Bradfordians accepted that the fire was a terrible piece of misfortune. A discarded cigarette and a dilapidated wooden stand, which had survived because of the club did not have the money to replace it, and accumulated paper litter were considered to have conspired to cause the worst disaster in the history of the football league. Legal Test Case In July 1985, an inquest was held into the deaths and the coroner recommended the death by misadventure outcome with which the jury agreed. The legal test case was then brought against the Bradford City AFC by David Britton, a police surgeon serving on the day, and by Susan Fletcher, who lost her husband John, 11-year-old son Andrew, John's brother Peter and his father Edmund in the fire. On 23rd February 1987, Sir Joseph Kentley found the club two-thirds responsible and the county council one-third responsible. Central to the test case were two letters sent to Bradford City's club secretary by the West Yorkshire Fire Brigade. The second letter dated 18th July 1984 specifically highlighted in full the improvements needed to be actioned at the ground as well as the fire risk at the main stand. The total amount of compensation to the 154 claimants was reported to be as high as 20 million pounds, with the payouts covered by insurance taken out by the club. The Bradford Disaster Appeal Fund was also set up only 48 hours after the disaster, eventually raising over 3.5 million pounds. Commendations in total, 28 police officers and 22 supporters, who were publicly documented as having saved at least one life, later received police commendations or bravery awards. Together, flanked by undocumented supporters, they managed to clear all but one person who made it to the front of the stand. Club coach Terry Yoret incurred minor injuries while taking part in the rescue. Martin Fletcher in 2010, Susan Fletcher's son and survivor of the Bradford City Fire, and witness to the Hillsborough disaster by the way, Martin Fletcher openly criticized the club's chairman Stafford Higginbottom at the time of the fire and the subsequent investigation. Fletcher said that the club at the time took no actual responsibility for its actions and nobody has ever really been held accountable for the level of negligence which took place. It was appalling that public money was given to the club while it was still owned by the same shareholders under whose direction the fire had happened. Fletcher subsequently published a book in 2015 called 56, The Story of the Bradford Fire, which revealed a history of fires at businesses owned by the Bradford City Chairman Stafford Higginbottom. Eight fires in the 18 years before the Bradford City Fire were identified, many catastrophic and leading to large insurance payouts.
Memorials At Valley Parade there are now two memorials. One, now resituated to the end of the stand where the fire began, is a sculpture donated on the initial reopening of Valley Parade in December 1986 by Sylvia Grauschop, a then Jersey-based former West Yorkshire woman. The other, situated by the main entrance, was donated by the club after its 7.5 million rebuilding of the original main stand in 2002. It has a black marble fascia on which the names and ages of those that died are inscribed in gold and a black marble platform on which people can leave flowers and mementos. Redevelopments of Valley Parade Grounds While Valley Parade was redeveloped, Bradford City played games at various neighboring grounds Allen Road Leeds, Leeds Road Huddersfield and Odstall Stadium in Bradford. Valley Parade reopened on 14th December 1986 when Bradford City beat an England 11-1 in a friendly. Since then, it has been further redeveloped and today Valley Parade is a modern 25,000 all-seater stadium which is virtually unrecognizable from how it was at the time of disaster. But the original clubhouse still stands beside the main stands as well as the flank support wall that runs down the Hollywell Ash Lane at the Bradford end. So this was story about Bradford City Stadium fire. Rest in peace to those who died and I would like to offer deepest condolences to those affected by this tragedy as well. Thank you all for watching.